Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Sense Think Act podcast. I'm Audro Nash, your host and a software engineer at Open Robotics. In today's episode, I speak with Dave Coleman, CEO at Picnic, which does engineering services and motion planning. Motion planning is the problem of moving something from one place to another, such as moving a robot from one location to another, or picking up an object and placing it somewhere else. This can be made more difficult if you try to avoid collisions. For example, if you had something beneath the table and want to lift it up over the table, you have to go around the table. And as you can imagine, this is a fundamental problem in robotics. And Dave has been involved in Move It, a motion planning framework that is built on top of the robot operating system or ROS for a number of years and has um, created Picnic to do engineering services around motion planning. We talked about his motion plan or the motion planning framework, Move It, how Picnic came to be, their work with NASA, and a paid service called Move It Studio that hopes to help the problem of supervised autonomy. And we tease the idea of Move It 3. I really enjoyed talking to Dave. He is a fun person to interview, and I find that he has a great perspective on robotics and open source, probably in no small part because of the diverse problems that they work on at Picnic and his time that he has been in the robotics community. I hope you enjoy. Uh, so Dave, would you start off by introducing yourself? Yeah, hey, hey Andrew. Uh, I'm Dave Coleman, uh, CEO of Picnic Robotics and a longtime supporter of uh, open source robotics, contributor to Ross and Move It. Um, glad to be here today. Awesome. Uh, to start off as a general overview, would you just tell us about Move It? What problems does it solve and how long it's been going? Sure. Uh, Move It is a framework developed to do motion planning, primarily for robotic arms, but also for the full kinematics of your robot. Uh, it's, it's had some mm -hmm. success in walking in mobile bases, even esoteric things like, quad, um, like uh, flying robots and uh, submersible. So all over the place, Move It's been applied. And it's the problem of how to motion plan your your joints through space so that you don't hit things and so that you can do useful things like manipulation and grasping. Mm -hmm. And your second question, it's been around since uh, I think 2010 was when development begun. And I think 2011 was the beta release of Move It. And this was developed at Willow Garage, um, same place that Ross was developed. So it was developed for the PR2 program. Um, Sasha and Cheetah was the program manager at the time of that project. And um, yeah, Willow Garage eventually uh, closed, but it, it lives mm -hmm. on. Let's see. And I know we said we talk about kind of your coming into this a bit later in the interview, but might as well get into it now. How did you get involved? So it started in 2010-ish um, at Willow Garage. When, when did you come along? Um, I was an intern at Willow Garage. Uh, Willow was very clever in having a lot of interns, huge program. So I guess I'm not that special. <laughs> and <laughs> the, the CEO at the time, Steve Cousins said that the intern program was a way of spreading Ross like, like a virus. He wanted us to go back to our research groups and get everyone to use Ross. And I think it was overall really effective strategy. And, mm -hmm. and so I was certainly part of that. I, I brought Ross and, and particularly Move It back to our research group uh, at, at CU Boulder, Colorado. Um, and, and so I was developing some of the initial parts of Move It together with Yon Sukin and the team. And I kind of decided to base the rest of my research during my graduate program around Move It and kind of did a lot of open source contributions to it. Mm -hmm. How did that look? I like doing a PhD, but also contributing largely to the open source part of this. How, like, it seems like the incentives are slightly different for what mm -hmm. the PhD would want and what an open source really useful tool would want. How did that go? Andrew, I think I, I think you know the answer to this question. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. a leading question. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think it worked well for me because working mm -hmm. in open source robotics gives you so much hands-on and experience. It's like relevant to industry, relevant to getting jobs uh, mm -hmm. after the fact. So I think it's a, a great way to, 
to, to kind of sharpen your role of experience. Um, mm -hmm. However, if your main motive is to publish papers, then it could be distracting, maybe. Just, I don't have any experience about <laughs> this, but <laughs> possibly could it distract you from publishing enough. Um, but you know, on, on the flip side, um, if done well, there's been a lot of examples where uh, you do some pretty cool research and you publish the open source code to it. I encourage everyone listening to do that if you're in academia. Mm -hmm. And it can actually increase your citations because people then can benchmark it and compare it against other methods. And um, so there's there's definitely advantages to doing both. Yes, for sure. And then uh, how did you go from PhD student contributing to this to now leading, uh, kind of taking on the initiative yourself? Um, I just looked it up, by the way. Move it Beta was officially released in 2013, and that's the same year that Willow closed, actually. And there was just kind of a, a, a leadership void in the Move it. I think the, the project was kind of floundering, and there were a lot of pull requests piling up and not being merged in. Um, mm -hmm. There was a little bit of support from SRI International after Willow closed, but it, it didn't last for very long. And so I was encouraged by a, a number of people at Open Robotics and others that were at, had been at Willow Garage who had been involved in MoveIt that I kind of like try to revitalize it. So Michael Ferguson uh, was a big player in encouraging it to be revitalized. I think he at the time was starting uh, the precursors to Fetch and mm -hmm. so that he was interested in, in using MoveIt for that. So. He, he and I planned World Move It Day, the first one ever. And so that was a, a big kickstart to getting a, a community kind of excited about Move It again and conveying that it is a, a thing. And a big part of that was getting the website um, updated so that it was just showing the, the latest things happening in the Move community. And there were two mm -hmm. other maintainers at the time who were still involved, uh, Robert Heisch and Michael Corner. And, and so we had our first maintainer meeting. And I think it was kind of three or four of us. And... We're like, yeah, let's let's see if we can get this thing flying again. And I think that was a what Michael said, and and sure enough, what we did, we you know, to a key to an open source project is just responding to pull requests uh, fast enough and reliably. And if you have enough people, so myself, Michael, and Robert, responding to pull requests, giving it decent reviews, keeping the code code base stable, uh, you'll eventually build a community. Assuming that the software does anything useful for people, and that's exactly what we did. Um, one of the big initiatives I first took was to put our first continuous integration into place, which nowadays uh, very is important. so blase, but like back at Willow Garage, that was still kind of cutting edge and we didn't have CI yet. So uh, Jonathan Bourne helped me get uh, Travis working and, and that and for the first time we could merge things with more confidence, not breaking code. Yep. Just to uh, be clear, so CI is continuous integration and that's running your tests that test that the code is working correctly. Right. Yeah, and you, you only want to run your tests if you have tests, and, and mm -hmm. we've over the years gotten the tests better at MoveIt, but there's still not enough, and at the time there wasn't a lot much at all. And so not only the tests, it just tests that it builds and that you can recreate the yep. build. The dependencies are uh, also correctly. And, and so one of the big goals of uh, adding CI was reducing the burden for the volunteer maintainers. And mm -hmm. so uh, you just want to get as many as much automation and bots helping so we... I implemented like a claim format style guide enforcer and, and those sort of mm -hmm. things so that the burden of code reviews got easier for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't have to always download the pull request and test it locally. Maybe for complex ones, you still want to do that, but you can just review it and say, this looks right. The the CI says it works, so let's merge it. And, and that's a way of leveraging automation to automation. reduce the work we have to do. Okay. So you did a lot of kind of this important infrastructure that made it easier for you guys to go and review pull requests quickly so that the community can kind of build it up. Is that really the way to look at it with the community contributing a lot and you're kind of just like managing it so that it stays working or you guys do your own feature development, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is the way I kind of look at it. There's different models. So some open source projects, there's just one or two or maybe a, a small lab group of people who are doing all the actual feature development. And then everyone else is kind of just uh, benefiting and taking and maybe submitting a bug report but not knowing how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Personally, I've always taken the approach of this project has too many, too, there's too much code, there's too many features. Like I, I can't do all this myself, so we're going to leverage the community. And there's mm -hmm. pluses and minuses to putting your energy towards fixing the problems versus it making it easier for others to fix the problems. And, mm. uh, you know, it's not as simple as it sounds adding people in because they have to then spend the time 
understanding the code base and like like dissecting it and and, and having quality reviews. So there's a there's a bit of both. I, I've definitely added a lot of features just as I was working on my PhD. I was like, oh, I need this feature. I'm gonna get this merged in. So both. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Okay. So that's an it's an interesting approach to um, focus mostly or focus largely on making it easier for people to contribute. And it's a cool approach. I do see what you mean when the code base grows to be so large that you need to make sure that, uh, like, basically you just facilitate it um, rather than going deep into adding addition. I, because you can't do it yourself because it's too large. So it seems like a good scalable approach to me, this kind of thing, especially when you guys have a few reviewers. Um, We've but been then, able to, to grow the number of reviewers. We, we call them maintainers over yep. the years, and uh, that, that's an important aspect: is encouraging newcomers to get more involved and get eventually give them the the, the access to have merge access, write access. And we actually mm -hmm. set up a program. I'd, I'd love to share real quick uh, sure. to help with that to bring in beginners more. We set up a core contributor program, and the idea being that when we see people who are getting really involved and maybe they don't have quite the in-depth skills yet then we don't fully trust them but we want to really appreciate what they're doing and, and set them up to become a maintainer in the future we'll add them as a core contributor and put them on our website so they get some credit for that That's and nice. you know i'm not sure if recently we've been using that enough but uh it's it's, it's been a plus you can see it on our website on the uh on the people how page does it, how does it compare to like an internship or something it's something someone does on their own time and you try to guide them or mentor them a little bit more or how, uh, how does it work? It's pretty informal. It's not as nearly as structured as an internship. I mean, one, there's no, no pay and in most engineering internships you do get paid. Uh, mm -hmm. but it's more like if you were a grad student working on motion planning for your research and you know how to use move it and you're just a rising uh, star, then we'll start off saying like, you're awesome, be a core contributor. And then after a few months or a year, if they continue to like really, demonstrate that they understand the code base and that they're capable of maintaining the quality standards and so forth, we would invite them to become, you know, full right access maintainer. So uh, is there a mentorship? Like, I think anyone who gets involved in MoveIt uh, will get mentorship via pull request reviews. I think this is often uh, undervalued, Overlooked. but yeah. the time that people put, so you say, I want to change this code. And if there are maintainers who decide to respond to it, uh, they will spend their time showing you like why certain code patterns or, or, or bugs or memory leaks, like helping you improve your code quality over time. So that's a great way to get mentorship. It actually was one of the ways I, I learned was just watching my code get reviewed. And also I watched other people's code get reviewed. And I learned a lot that way. Cause I'd be like, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't see that issue. Next time I'll know better to like look out for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been a lot of my experience too. That code reviews are because it, it's it's line by line through the thing through the code change that you have, and then they can um, critique you on the approach or anything. So it's a really good way to get feedback, and it can be done asynchronously. So you can take a while um, to like understand the comments um, and get lots of different approaches. So I've personally found that very valuable um, at Open Robotics. Uh, all yeah. the code reviews and even community code reviews, which are always amazing when someone steps in from the community. Yeah, totally. You just gotta be, yeah, sometimes a, a thick skin because there's a lot of code to be reviewed and sometimes uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I've been guilty of this. Like you review it really quickly and, and you don't like cherry code it so much. You're just like, uh -huh. this needs to be fixed, this terse. needs to be fixed. And then I, I've encouraged people at the movement maintainer group to still always say, thank you for this contribution. That's kind of a summary. Uh, even if we've like totally redlined and tore apart your code. <laughs> You yeah. know, so you gotta, gotta just be aware that we're just trying to help you and, and keep the code quality up so that future people mm -hmm. can improve it as well. Yeah, um, at Open Robotics, we talk about how a lot of times in text, it seems to be a lot um, more harsh, whatever you say. Um, so then kind of being aware of that while giving feedback. But you're right, when there's a lot of code to review, it's like, it's um, it's tough to have really I don't know. You, you you have to get through it, and so you might make a comment that's a little rough. That's awesome, though. Um, are you so you have this program to bring on people who are contributing and give them a little more responsibility within the organization? How has it been to grow from your core group of three to now? You guys are around thirty employees, if I'm correct, or 
Yeah, uh, I, I do want to differentiate. The Move It Community Project and mm -hmm. my company Picnic, they're not, they're not the same set. <laughs> ah, okay, let's, let's talk. So uh, let's explain Picnic, I guess. Yeah, uh, but to finish, to finish that first thought, um, mm -hmm. so Michael and Robert, for example, they are uh, a professor or a, a PhD student, in, in, uh, respectively, in Germany, um, unaffiliated with Picnic, and yet they are major contributors to the project. There's a, a number of other maintainers unaffiliated with Picnic, like Felix, who has mm -hmm. done a lot of great stuff. So uh, maybe half at this point of the maintainers are from Picnic, and I, I'm, I'm proud of that, and I'm glad that we've been able to hire people and get them excited uh -huh. enough about open source that they're like major contributors to the project now. Um, like Henning Kaiser has been a, a, a big lead for the Move It project, Tyler. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a mix. And we wanna make sure that the Move It project remains um, something separate from Picnic, uh, although there are, there's plenty of overlap as well. There's a lot of overlap. So can you tell me a bit about the two? So Move It is the open source motion planning framework and Picnic is a consulting and research company around this area, or how would you think of it? Yeah, um, we we called we used the word consulting uh, in the early days. I've actually tried to distance myself from that word because uh, mm. I, I prefer the word engineering services. It comes off more as like we want to co-develop or develop for you robotic software using Move It, using ROS, using other perception navigation packages, um, mm. and so. You're we're not just like advising you on how to do it. I, I mean, that is a small part of what we do, but it's not um, our main goal. Um, by working with your with other in, uh, companies and other teams, we do kind of consult with them, but we do it mm -hmm. through working side by side. Yeah, so it's developing a lot rather than just advising, and that's why you like this engineering services term better than yeah. consulting. Or more, more hands on. <laughs> more hands on. And does it, um, so if you use the two different terms, does it change the types of clients that come to you? Or what's the, or it's how you think of yourself or why? why yeah, I think it, 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 it changes the, I mean, words are important. It changes the mindset. When a, when a potential client comes to us, it's mm -hmm. not that we're gonna get on a, a meeting with you once a week for an hour and discuss uh, the best way of using Move It. We, we do offer feasibility studies um, mm -hmm. and those have been very popular with our, our customers, but we hope that after the feasibility study that they would uh, then hire us to actually implement a lot or some of it, all of it, you know, some combination of that with, with their team. And, and yeah. so that's kind of our consulting offering is the feasibility study. Ah, I see. And then so now a lot of this, is it um, the business model is something like um, if they allow you to open source whatever you're developing for Move It or for them for Move It, then they um, don't, like, like it's incentivized kind of you charge them less if what you are doing can be open source or it's a feature you want or how does it how does it work no, you know, we don't we don't have a model like that um we we're pretty clear in, in our contracts and we have a lot of discussions with, with lawyers that um when you hire a picnic some portion of it is going to be open source and the only question mm -hmm. is how much and mm. we've had a, some projects that everything is open sourced and we're delighted. But in reality, uh, we don't expect that. That's not normal. Um, it's, it's typically that like we're helping them build out their application specific IP, intellectual property, and mm -hmm. it's building off of MoveIt or, or ROS or other components of the whole open source robotics ecosystem. And we insist that bug fixes or small features, hooks, just little things that like, that really shouldn't be anything differentiating them. Uh, those get open sourced. Um, and we, you know, we, if it, if it's like a thing that originated in move it or in Ross and we're just like slightly improving it, we'll likely open source that. But if it's like some fancy new algorithm for a particular type of application, then absolutely. Like if our customer wants that proprietary, we're, we're not, we're not here to like be, gotcha. be like too, too zealot about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and but the, the key is that we don't want to fix the same bug over and over again. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And also it's nice for the whole community to just benefit from any work you do with these things. Yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of like um, a, a giving it back, paying it forward type of thing of like, mm -hmm. you're benefiting from all this prior work that's saved you tons of R and D hours and like bootstrapping oh, yeah. whatever program you have. And and now we just ask that some of that be contributed back to the next person or, or you know, like, 
one of the big arguments we have about the question of like open sourcing versus like forking uh, open source project is that you don't want to take on maintenance and ownership of that project in the future. But yeah. if you stay with the mainline project, then companies like uh, Picnic and Open Robotics and, and other contributors will Making take care of that for you, maintaining mm -hmm. the, the basics of bug fixes and new oper operating systems and patches. Yeah. And uh, just to be clear with the terminology, so when you're forking a project, you're taking it and you're saying this is, I'm like, I'm taking it in its current state and I'm gonna go move it somewhere else. Um, and then I'm gonna work on it and maintain. So you can hide it, um, what you actually contribute to um, if you're some company. Um, I'm sure that happens. They diverge. All, all, all the, oh, totally. I'm sure it hops out the but you, you really can't see it typically. Nope. Yeah, so it, it's nice having it all in the open so they can just grab the main move it branch our main move it repository and then um, apply fixes directly to that and benefit everyone. That's, it seems like the big argument for open source to me. Yeah. And, and it's like, it's not just benefiting everyone, but it's benefiting the individual companies making these decisions because they are mm -hmm. not taking on the ownership. They say that like, ah. once you like writing a, a line of code that the cost of that for like an engineer to do that is only a fraction of the overall cost of that code over its lifetime. Because for every like hour spent coding, you're going to spend several more hours maintaining it, bug fixing it mm -hmm. over the lifetime of your product or your robotics mm -hmm. project or what have you. So it's really reducing your maintenance cost over the long term. Yep. Yeah. And time and um, I don't know, energy and everything. There's just so many things, um, even like running up your um, continuous integration time because you have to test more things, which make it more difficult. Um, as well as just engineering that's, hours to fix bugs. It's a good point. And we're, we're talking a lot about like industry users of, of, of open source software, but you know, there's a lot of other reasons and motivations why students, graduate students would, would choose to contribute to open source uh, as, as well. So there's, there's both worlds. I just want to want to say, what do you, so what are some of the motivators for people in academia, students um, to contribute to open source? It's building up your portfolio, your experience, mm -hmm. getting that mentorship we were talking about, um, kind of being a part of something bigger. There's a, there's a, just a sense of like seeing that you contributed to code that's being used all over the world and mm -hmm. being able to brag about that. And, and like for many people, maybe they haven't ever contributed to real software before. And so this is like kind of a, a good first step in their career. So there, there's those sorts of things. But really, there's a chance just to learn a lot. Mm hmm. Totally agree. Yeah, my experience at Open Robotics, um, really, it, I get a lot of satisfaction from contributing to things that I know that other people are using. So I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, going back a little bit, um, Picnic, when did Picnic come along um, in the scheme of things? So you were contributing in your PhD to this, and it was you and a small group of other maintainers. How, where did Picnic come from? It was 2015, and mm -hmm. I, like yourself, uh, recently, I was an intern, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I was interning at Google, so pretty mm -hmm. lucky place to be, uh, Google Robotics to be exact. And after the internship ended, there was a group there who wanted, I, I'd help them use MoveIt for some projects. Uh, I, mean, I shouldn't say too much here, um, but they wanted more of that. They wanted more support, and I, they asked for another internship. I said... No, I'm not going to intern again. <laughs> I've had a lot of internships. And so they said, do you want to consult for Google? And I said, of course I do. And so wow. that is what uh, begun Picnic. Um, and, and technically, like, we, we had been, so Picnic, had, the term originated from a team at the university that I was attending uh, for the Amazon Picking Challenge. And so hmm. Picking Challenge, Picnic, uh, a, a friend just helped me coin this, this, this term. So I asked the team, I, I was the team lead. I was like, hey, can I use this term for doing some consulting? And everyone's like, no problem. So that's kind of the origin story. Gotcha. And so it was just you at the beginning consulting for Google for some project that used MoveIt. That's right. Um, and you grew from there to now 30 people or so? Yep. kind of thing? Yep. That's exciting. So 2015, it started, and we're in 2021. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so I had to finish my PhD. So I, I graduated, took a little time off to travel. And when I came back, uh, I just kept getting requests from different companies that were using mm -hmm. MoveIt for support. And so I'd fly out to different companies and, and do more consulting, but also a lot of coding. 
and mm -hmm. I realized I had too much work and I uh, made the, uh, the pivotal decision to bring on some co-founders and that certainly changed things. It's been a lot of work since then <laughs> managing <laughs> yeah. a company, um, but it, it's been really fun and exciting also. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So what have been some of the projects that you've worked on with Picnic? Um, like just the nature of it. So the kinds of things you can solve with move it in a less abstract form. Sure. Yeah. I, I will avoid company names because NDAs get tricky uh, uh -huh. and we're on a, a public forum here, but uh, one of, so like logistics was our second project, like warehouse bin picking type of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. The next one was robot cooking and then a really big one for us was robot surgical. cooking. Yeah, you know, like more. stirring things, cutting things, like a home chef. That's cool. Oh yeah. There's a, there's a couple couple companies out there doing this. And yep. We've actually worked with a lot of them, um, but that was one of our early projects. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we another one of our bigger projects has been surgical uh, robotics, and you know, it's been used to do surgery. But of course, they had to do a lot of rewriting of certain segments to make it FDA certifiable and uh. like move. It's a really great starting point for some applications, but sometimes you have to like do a lot of sh uh, shaping it to be something that's safe enough for human use. So I, I don't recommend you use move it out of the box to do surgery. <laughs> don't mistake me here, but yeah, we, we worked with this company for a long time. It was a really fun project. And, and since then, like the, the application we use it for, it, it just astonishes me how diverse it's been. Since then, I mean, we're it's we've worked for several space applications, several underwater robotics, like mm -hmm. doing manipulation with oil and gas, um, telehealth, because uh, all, all all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. We're doing one of our big projects now is robot farming, so harvesting of fruits and vegetables. Y you name it, like we've probably been involved. Hmm. That's so cool. And it's because motion planning is just such a fundamental robotics problem. And you guys have a bunch of really great tools around there. Yeah, it turns out like even though you don't see robot arms used a lot outside of the factory, I think you're going to see a lot more of that very soon because we're working with a lot of early stage R&D groups, uh, so whether cool. it's corporate or startup. Uh, mm -hmm. to use robots for new applications. But it, it turns out that robot arms are extremely useful because the whole world's designed for human arms. And that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to mimic. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really cool. And I actually, towards the end of the interview, I want to ask about where you think things are going because I assume from all the consulting that you have an incredible idea about kind of where things are headed because you're seeing these early applications, which is so cool. Um, but the, um, okay. So you started this now, um, congratulations. You're having larger customers. You mentioned that you have a collaboration with NASA. Uh, would you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for, for bringing that up. We're, I just think space is really cool. <laughs> space is really cool. <laughs> and, and, it, and it seems like there's this big movement, at least in the U S but I think it's pretty international of, um, commercializing space. It's becoming more privatized. There's a lot of startups. There was the uh, XPRIZE a few years ago, and some companies came out of that, like that Virgin Galactic flight just recently came out of mm -hmm. that. And just in general, now that SpaceX has made flights, getting stuff to space so much cheaper and more regular, uh, we're seeing a lot of other applications. And so a lot of companies are working on um, uh, satellite assembly is a big one and using robot mm -hmm. arms for that, doing more experiments in the space station or in the future uh, gateway station being worked on. Uh, I, don't, honest, I don't I don't know very much about space applications or the um, different ways that companies are trying to make a profit out of space. So mm -hmm. you said satellite assembly that's on Earth or is that in space? In space. Um, oh, wow. So you send up the components and then build it out up there. Yeah. OK. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the big motivations is that things have to currently compress into these little rocket modules. Uh, but mm -hmm. sometimes you want to build things bigger than that. So you need to assemble in space. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that would be used for a bunch of applications, um, like taking photos of the earth or maybe sending internet places like Starlink or whatever it might be, this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it, I guess I don't know a ton about like what 
what I mean, yeah, assembling satellites for all the, the normal cases of what, what you just said. Yep. Okay. And then what other applications were you saying for space? Um, so just doing more things uh, without astronauts in space, uh, like mm -hmm. on the space station. So NASA's had this long standing program to have robots augment the astronauts time. Astronauts are wildly expensive to send up to maintain, like every hour of their work day, their, their billable rate is very, very high. <laughs> well, not because, that salary, but because of just all the training, all the, the fuel oh, yeah. infrastructure. Would you, I mean, I bet it's like comically large, how large, how expensive they are per hour. What would you, I knew the number, you, would you have I what it was, but is it like $10,000 an hour or is it way more than that? I, I wish I had that off the top of my head. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. So what is, what is it that you guys are doing? Are you looking for a number? Yeah, I am looking for a number, <laughs> uh, but I don't, I don't see it. Um, so they're using Move It right now on the this program called the Robonaut, which is in the space station, Ooh. and to like help do some more of the maintenance tasks of mm -hmm. the station, uh, like yeah. cleaning surfaces or, or like just flipping would switches, you, just like things that like maybe aren't worth the astronauts' time. Would you describe Robonaut? Because it's a pretty wild looking thing. Yeah, it's um, it's very anthropomorphic. It like built mm -hmm. to look like a human for the most part. So it's got fully dexterous fingers. Uh, it's mm -hmm. got a, a head that can rotate and look around. It's got like a chest, just like a human. Uh, the legs, however, are a bit creepier. They're I think more like yep. spider legs. So there's just yeah. two legs, but because you're in zero G, you don't need legs that can walk like on earth. You just need something mm -hmm. that can grab onto handrails. And so that part's a little creepier. And I, I am not the definitive source of the status of this program, but it's, uh, I think it's a little bit uh, winding down and, and they're like revisiting what kind of robots best for space. And, mm. um, and so for the gateway, which is a new station being launched soon to orbit the moon. Um, one of the big needs there cool. is a uh, inner vehicle robot that can take care of the station when it's unmanned. Cause they aren't planning on having uh, a human there all, all times of the year. I think closer to like four months of a year, it'll be manned eight That's months exciting. of the year. The robots got to take care of the place. And so, um, we're currently on a grant involved with that. Huh. So it'll be the Robonaut Robo robot on this on the gateway, which is orbiting the moon. Um, and it will be taking care of a lot of operations by doing what a human might do if they were on it. Um, is it going to be teleoperated or is it going to be largely autonomous or? Hmm. Yeah, I love this topic. <laughs> um, I think teleoperated to me, the definition of that is really drive by wire. You've got a joystick or a mouse or these days a VR headset with two hand controllers and you're telling the robot <laughs> yeah. what to do, like basically one to one. And you know, it's not exactly one to one because oftentimes the robot arm may have a different kinematic morphology than a human. And so the way it maps out your command might be slightly different, but for the most part, you know, I'm talking about like Cartesian control which is like in, in the factor control. But for the most part, you're just, you tell what to do. That's mm -hmm. tell you to me. Yeah, and so you move, like it would be like moving joysticks around, like the, the VR things and the robot would do pretty much the same motion, but it might do slightly different things because its joints might be different than a human's. Exactly. Uh, okay. Yeah, and so that breaks down when you're on the moon and particularly if you go to Mars, which is the next stepping stone for the space program, as Elon yep. lets us all know, uh, <laughs> because uh, latency and bandwidth issues, delays in time. So I think to the moon, it's like three, four seconds. And to the Mar to Mars, it's like several minutes. Um, don't quote me on this. I don't memorize numbers, as you can tell so far. <laughs> but um, that becomes really annoying and frustrating to control something with that amount of lag because you send a command and then you have to wait round trip for it to come back. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're very interested at Picnic. We're developing some technology that is a mix of fully autonomous and teleoperated. So what, what's between Ooh. those two extremes? And, like and a, that's, yeah. That, that's what you're trying to figure out or yeah, that's, that's what, we're what you're proposing? Ah. That is what we're working on right now. So is it uh, like a higher level thing where you can delegate task like at a task level you say go select this go do your thing here and it will kind of get over so if it's flip a switch it will the robonaut will go over there and position itself and perhaps flick it but you've directed that it should do that so it's, it's like a higher level 
command exactly. thing where ah that's very yeah, cool so this goes under a number of names but uh, supervised autonomy is maybe the most common one where you that you are seems like an off. oxymoron but i i, I understand <laughs> it but yeah it, it, yeah it, it does so you tell the robot hey here's a high level task and then mm -hmm. you're kind of observing the robot as it goes about doing it with the understanding that maybe the robot's not quite smart enough to fully do the task because these are just hard problems. They're kind of unsolved so far, especially mm -hmm. when you're in unstructured environments. Um, I've had arguments about whether a, a space station like the ISS is unstructured or not, kind of an academic argument. Because um, I, I, you know, my mind, these things are highly engineered things where they have exact computer models before they get launched. Oh, um, yeah. but if, you, if you look at videos on like YouTube of astronauts giving you a tour of the space station i'm really it's really striking how many bags and wires and new experiments are just floating in the middle of the, the way and so actually it's an extremely complex environment and so for a robot to be able to fully autonomously navigate this ever-changing environment to do useful things it yeah it's 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 hard for today's algorithms and so the going back to supervised autonomy there's a human there to help it along when needed but really minimizing how much intervention is needed from the from the human. Hmm. Okay, that's really cool. Um, do you think that this will be a larger thing in robotics, like this supervised autonomy? Do you think it before? I mean, we see it with like, like you you can think of like Tesla and its self driving as being somewhat supervised autonomy. You sit there in the seat and it drives for you um, until it cannot handle whatever's going on, and then it gives you back control. Uh, do you think that this is going to be a larger trend before robots are like actually capable of exactly. doing most things entirely? That's exactly what I think. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Tesla versus Waymo versus the other like, crews, self-driving car companies, they all have slightly different approaches to how they're doing Thomas vehicles. But mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting um, that Way Waymo and a number of the other ones, they've all kind of realized that in order to get to L5 autonomy, actually you need a remote operator that occasionally mm -hmm. can help this like the robo taxi get unstuck so you know a lot of the prototype or, or concept vehicles that i think are going to be out soon they may, may not have a steering, steering wheel and so if you think about a taxi and maybe the seats are facing inward um, there's no one there to take over if the robot just the car really gets stuck a, a tesla mm -hmm. has a steering wheel still and they're not they're a different play that's so why i would they're a different category of autonomy in my opinion but uh, <laughs> the idea with like waymo is that there's someone in a call center who maybe isn't watching every turn every step of the way but when it's needed they can be you know called in to give the robot a little more understanding like hey this is a construction site we haven't quite seen this problem before but this is what i want you to do and the robot can mm -hmm. then go okay i'm gonna maneuver around this so that that's proving out to be a necessary need in self-driving cars and i think it's also going to be more and more in need as we get robot arms outside of factories. Mm. Yeah, I bet you're right. It's a very interesting thing. Because um, you can kind of augment where ro like robots can do maybe 80% of it or 70% of it. Uh, but then there's some part of it that people just need to be there for their judgment. Um, and so we can buffer. But I, I think you kind of hinted at it a second ago, like, eventually we won't need this again. Like we're uh -huh. going to get the machine learning algorithms and the software and, and all of it so intelligent that the, the human will be then removed completely. But there's been some interesting research about like how AI is harder than we think. And mm -hmm. we've hit some critical limits of current machine learning techniques. And this is why the self-driving car industry has been so delayed. And uh -huh. so I think it's going to be longer than we think. Like you kind of have to get general intelligence general AI in order to cl completely eliminate the human from it. And I'm not super stoked personally about even achieving that because then you have the whole super intelligence thing. And what I if know. it gets smarter than us and <laughs> <laughs> Terminator? Yeah. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. I don't know. It, it is all very interesting. And I do, um, from my own, um, like foray into machine learning and things, I, I have trouble understanding how the metaphors can get to, a more general intelligence at the moment. Um, Which is probably but, good for humanity. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but, um, all right, so then you're, how, how long have you guys been on this NASA project? 
Uh, it's actually just the past year. So yeah, not, not even a year yet, just under a year we've been involved in this. Um, but we, we recently got our next phase of, of grant money with them and uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's, we're doing this with NASA, but we're also starting to do this more and more with our other customers um, mm -hmm. using open source move it, but also developing some uh, higher level task planning proprietary aspects of it that um, we, so because we've had some past customers ask us to build this kind of one off and now we're mm -hmm. making kind of a, a general solution for this overall supervised autonomy problem. So uh, ah. I, I think that's going to just really unlock a lot of applications in the next decade or I think two. So too. Yeah, I've been, I, I don't know, I've been thinking that this is one of the big problems on the front of robotics. Like, um, and I, I think you're, you're hitting it on the head and actually doing it, which is very cool. Um, this supervised what, what, what autonomy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ma making it so that you can delegate at a higher level for robots, what to do, and then have some sort of thing come in and help. Um, like the, these, it just, it seems so necessary. Um, I think there's an interesting, interesting pattern about past robot companies and how they've gotten around this and why maybe there isn't a solution out there for this exactly is that to typically, um, you choose an application. I'm going to solve um, like a robot that. Uh, what's a good example here? That picks widgets from a bin that's just unsorted, right? This is <laughs> a big one right now. That yeah. a lot of companies are going after, like a mixed mm -hmm. parcel box, and you can make a bunch of assumptions and fix your stuff, and do just enough autonomy and AI and like computer vision to solve that problem really well and reliably. And those those solutions like keep coming to market. So like in the seventies, maybe the problem was how do we spray paint a car really mm -hmm. reliably? And they came up with exactly the tools for that. Um, and so we, we keep pushing slowly the envelope of a robot doing a very fixed thing for harder problems, but, uh, and, and there's, there's a lot of benefits like fully autonomous has a better return on investment in terms of like, you're totally eliminating the job versus like still requiring a human to be kind of assisting it sometimes. Yep. But I just think that's not going to go all the way to like a robot that can navigate through your your office, your home, like outside oh, yeah. in a wreck, and just like assist or, or space in particular, or space. and assist any arbitrary problem you throw at it, and have it be able to achieve it. So that's yeah. I think that's what we need next. Yes, yeah. Even the modern ones, it's like they're somewhat like the picking the widgets out of the bin. The approaches seem to be somewhat flexible to variation, but it's like you throw a different bin or a new widget in. And then you have to reprogram everything and add uh, new like hacks or so, less general solutions to get it to work again. And, and maybe there yet in terms maybe of new machine learning techniques. The difficulty of adding a new widget it's gone way down. Maybe I, I think it's probably really easy to arbitrary object train it really quickly. Yeah. But still, if you ask it to then like paint a car or do a different, totally different task, yeah. it's just not going to be yeah adjusted to that. Yep. Yeah, that's a better way to phrase it. It's just if you choose a different task, it is unable to cope um, yeah. with the same system. You can run another program and have that actually work, perhaps. But you, it has to be a specialized program in itself um, to do the different tasks. And, and I think the key there is you said you have to run another program. And so yep. who is that you? The you is the uh, operator. Yep. So, so like really giving the operator a slew of a library of programs that are more general and let the robot do a lot of autonomy. But when the robot like gets stumped, there's a human there to like push it along. Like, Hey, here's a little hint. And then mm -hmm. what one really cool idea that we are not, uh, you know, pursuing exactly yet, but like you have all this human interfering like, or, or intervening, helping the robot. And then that actually mm -hmm. creates more training data to train yes. the robot. So then you have yep. this like cycle of, labeled semantic data that you can use yep. for future machine learning models. It's a virtuous cycle. It is totally yeah. more data, more to train on. You can get more sophisticated and you get closer to actually solving your problem. I am yeah. not a machine learning expert though. So I won't, I won't claim any. Yeah, me neither. Sure. Let's see. So that's really exciting. How do you, so with NASA, and I don't know if you can say, um, how, how are you doing like, do you have a simulation of what it's like to be on the um, on the gateway that space? The what what do they call them? Space stations. 
Yeah, the space station that's going around the moon. Do you have a simulation of that? Are you working on like don't like really specific problems for them? Or are you working on general technologies that they're going to apply to that situation? Or I assume it's a mix. But... Yeah, it's more general technologies at this point. We hope to move towards more specific problems in the future. Uh, but uh, Move It in the, has been used a lot with the space station. And so in Gazebo, another open source common library in ROS, they, uh, groups at NASA have created uh, not full simulations of the space station, but a full simulation of a particular module that included mm -hmm. the railing that you can grab onto and maybe some problems. So there, that, there has been work that the, the robot using the open motion planning library would move through this environment using its creepy spider legs and its know, arms yeah, to, so... <laughs> to like creepy spider legs. pull a, a cargo bag and like open the Velcro, like some pretty cool tasks. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, that, that's been worked on. And, and so uh, some of the guys that are at our company have been involved in that program. That's so cool. Is there any um, hard, so I guess, does this already, does the gateway already exist or is, is it already up there or that's a thing in the future? I believe uh, it's not launched yet. So are there, uh, I mean, I'm just wondering if you're like doing the sinusoidal flight in an airplane with a robonaut that's floating for a few seconds and trying to do something or. No, no. I mean, like, we're we're not we're not that involved in this yet. Because uh, that would be so there. cool. <laughs> that that would be. <laughs> so you could fight against gravity by doing that. <laughs> That's so cool. Uh, I, I mean, right. like, you don't have gravity; it just makes all the manipulation problems, I think, easier. Because things huh. like if they don't have any momentum, they just stay. It's true. Unless um, if they would be floating, it would probably be very difficult because oh, there'd be yeah. no force to press into. Like they just move away from you if you put any force that's asymmetric into that's them. That's a good point. But easier if they're stationary because you just. But huh. So I, I think uh, one thing that seems really exciting about this to me is open source being used at NASA is amazing. Like that, I feel like that's a huge win for the open source community. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, uh, they've, they've been uh, involved with Ross and funding open robotics for a while, I, I believe is my understanding. And um, I, I think that they see that this is a great way of tech transfer from what's the latest in academia. And they see it as a way to um, kind of standardize and, and hire people who already know that the technology and um, I, Ross just kind of become a standard, and, and, and so NASA recognizes that, mm -hmm. or various teams at NASA recognize it. The really interesting thing to me is when I think NASA, I think of like incredibly robust, like they're really concerned about reliability. Mm. And it's interesting to me that they're going to open source for things that are important in their application, like controlling a robonaut in the yeah. space station. Like that, so that's the, really interesting to me. Yeah, good question. I mean, maybe it's not a question, but uh, I have a, a thought on that is with the Robonaut, their strategy, um, the group at Johnson Space Center was to make the low level controls really mm. hardened. And like, I'm not sure if I'd call it like flight certified, but um, certified quality and rigor such that it was guaranteed not to extract, uh, to exert enough, uh, the force to like punch into a space station, for example. Like, mm -hmm. they can't break the station because that's extremely dangerous. Uh, and and so if you un like if the underlying controllers and like the hardware interface, it like reaches the right certification level of safety and that it can't go beyond a certain velocity and a certain torque, then you can uh, then think about the layer above that, kind of the application layer, with a more modern like rapid iteration software development techniques that, that allows for more powerful compute and more like advanced methodologies but sometimes it does maybe sacrifice the rigor of a very simple system that uh is is flight ready uh i see what you mean so it's nice to so you can have that base layer that nasa writes that makes sure that the robonaut's not going to break anything and then after that you can put your more sophisticated layer Oh, and your layer that does higher level control, like yeah, so move here, do this. There's often a trade off of like, if you want to have these like high resolution meshes that in like sensor data where you're like able to plan at higher level thinking and at task levels, the software mm -hmm. gets very complex. 
And there's just like a lot of possibilities where sensor noise could cause errors or just all the interacting interacting systems on different threads and cores just can cause a little bit more unexpected timing. And so you definitely need to have like an underlying like super safe layer on top of all these advanced capabilities. Yep. So um, now I see that we are like, run, I see that we're running out of time and I know there's a few things that we want to talk about. Um, so would you tell me a bit about premium? So move it premium and how, like, what is that? And what's the model? No, I just did. <laughs> um, ah. So we're calling it Move it Studio. Um, and, and that- Move it Studio? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you made time for this. I'm surprised that we're running out of time. This has flown by. But yeah, Move it Studio, it, so we we have been doing engineering services for the past four or five years, and it's been a lot of fun, but we think that the next stage of growth uh, at Picnic is gonna involve, and, and, and not only the next stage of growth, but the way that we can have a bigger impact towards growing the Move it open source project is by also offering a premium version that that like larger companies would be really excited to pay for because they get all these additional features and and so we tried to make sure not to come up with a premium feature that uh, conflicts with the core feature set of Move It because we don't want to be trying to make a a better version of Move It but instead Move It Studio is the operator human loop supervised autonomy uh, aspect. That, oh, that's right? cool. That's yeah. So, so like we're gonna keep improving the underlying grasping library and planning libraries and kinematics and, and like the hand-eye calibration tools, improving all that for the overall community, but also like we've, we've made this dividing line. Uh, some might say it's controversial, but there's been, it's, I've studied a lot of like open source business models of, of past successes. And it's like very common, either you come up with a SaaS play where you're selling an internet service on top of your open source library, think mm -hmm. WordPress, or you're coming up with a premium version of the software that and you can sell. software at. as a service. Software uh, as a service, thank you, yeah. Or, or you have this, just like this license software on top of it. So WordPress yep. actually did that also. They have Jetpack, which <laughs> they're like premium yep. plugins if you know WordPress at all. Or mm -hmm. another example is like Apache Spark is a really a popular uh, open source library for I think data analysis. I don't use it, but um, this company Databricks made a product on top of it that mm -hmm. has allowed Apache Spark to continue to grow also. So that's the, yeah. the, the new, well, one of our new strategies on top of our engineering services. Seems smart. The It, it reminds me, like a, another example, um, there's Tailwind, which is a CSS framework, if I understand correctly. And they have Tailwind UI, which is kind of, it's the same breakdown that you're doing. So they have the open source one that gives you all the functionality, but then they have components um, so if you want to make it more useful and the, I guess not exactly the same, but the like this, the uh, supervised autonomy, like more structured interactions with what you're doing that kind of fit a template. Yeah. They have literal templates for um, making HTML and CSS components. That's their part yeah. that they charge for. Um, That's a pretty good example. I mean, for, for us, it's like one way to think about it is that there's like a front end for move it yep. now. Yeah, so exactly. Um, but there is a lot more under the hood besides just a front end. Yep. Also. Very interesting. So how, what's the timeline on that? Um, well, I, like, where are we now in this? Great question. Uh, we have two reference customers currently that are that we've released an alpha to, and we're in talks with a number of other early, early mm -hmm. customers. Uh, and so th we plan to have the beta operating at Roscon. Mm -hmm. We should have it. Um, should be running at our booth. If oh. you know, I, I assume our viewers are familiar with the Ross conference in in, in New Orleans this year. Uh, so that'll be October twenty twenty one. So hopefully we'll have a, a pretty cool demo to show. Oh, I can't wait to see. Will you guys be? Um, will you have Move It Con or anything nearby at the, around the same time, like a yeah, day before uh, or so after or whatever it might be? This year we're not doing a standalone Move It Con event. I think our main motivation was we weren't one hundred percent sure about COVID, and so we thought we would just uh, focus our resources on the main Roscon event. So yep. we, we, are having a new, we are having a workshop correct? the day before the official Roscon event starts, but it's a, a part of the Roscon workshops we're having. And, mm. and that one is actually totally unrelated to supervised autonomy. Um, we have been adding to open source move it some better features around mobile manipulation, which is the idea that you can synchronize 
the mobile base of your robot with the arms so that you can expand your workspace for, for doing tasks. Hmm. So like when you think about a human, you're trying to reach something across the table. You could, I don't know, get up and walk around the table or you could like reach across it. But both of those modalities require using more than just your arm. So mm -hmm. that, that kind of functionality, it's always kind of been a move it, but we've greatly improved it. And so the workshop will be about how to use that on a hollow robot stretch platform, which is a, a startup in the Bay Area making some pretty cool mobile manipulators. And by cool, I mean low cost. Uh, it looks like a stick figure, but it's also oh, really I'm familiar really with it. Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. So they will be there with us. Uh, Picnic will be kind of doing tutorials on how to use uh, move it for that application. Hmm. Now I know we've said a lot about like like talking about the um, studio version, and you guys are working with NASA. But what's what's next for Picnic and Move It outside of those? Like where are you guys headed? Would you think? Yeah. Um, so mobile manipulation is uh, mobile manipulation is one of our big focus our points. Big like guiding wins is like. We need arms to be able to synchronize better with bases. And so continuing that thread. Um, another big thread for us is hybrid planning, which is the combination of global planners and local planners, the best of mm -hmm. uh, real-time planning and global really smart planning. They both have pros and cons. If you mm -hmm. combine them, you get the best of both worlds. And so uh, we've been adding more features on that the past year. We're working with Fraunhofer over in Europe on uh, a demo of this technology. So that's, that's one of our big threads. Mm -hmm. um, that, I'm, I'm trying to think what else is on our roadmap. I, I can check real quick. Sure. Uh, we're still like, I guess, getting the last finishing touches on Move It 2. Um, I mean, Move, Move, Move It 2 is basically feature complete. We have a blog post recently just talking about what By feature complete, you mean up to Move It 1 in terms correct. of capabilities. And Move It 2, as a reminder, is just move it migrated to ROS2, except mm -hmm. it's not just that, because we've been adding, like all of our new features are now going into move it to. So if you're on mm -hmm. move it one, we encourage you to upgrade. Um, it is a lot of hassle because you have to upgrade your ROS version as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think more and more of the community is making the jump. And so when I said uh, about feature complete, um, parameters and launch files are still a little bit rough in mm -hmm. like ROS2 Foxy. I think a lot That's of true. it got fixed in Galactic. Um, but now that it's fixed in Galactic, we're having to finish up the MoveIt Setup Assistant, which is simply a user interface that lets you easily set up an arbitrary robot with MoveIt. Mm -hmm. And we have to just make it work with a new style of launch files and, and, and configuration files. So gotcha. you, you, can, you can do it without the Setup Assistant. It's just more work. We're trying to make it easier to do it. For sure. Yeah, hopefully that will get even easier with Humble, uh, the next one, which will be released, um, I don't know, May of next year, 2022. Yeah. Hopefully. Uh, hopefully. And another big one that uh, I think we have momentum on is being able to remove end effectors and add different end effectors. Ooh, swap them out? Live in Move It. That's and so awesome. this is a deep structural change, but there's a number of people at Picnic working on this right now, talking about the architecture. We'll see if we can get it merged in and the community doesn't balk at the changes. But <laughs> <laughs> um, when your URDF changes, it really like it breaks a lot of underlying data structures of how MoveIt mm -hmm. thinks about your robot. And so we're trying to restructure that. And that's been a yeah. common request from customers for years. I so, could imagine, yeah. Uh, I'm excited about if, if that actually lands in the next version. And that actually, um, just to change topics, Audrey, uh, that might end up being what we call MoveIt 3 is a, a API change of that magnitude. We'd probably wrap up. Oh, uh, it's that significant of a change. It's, it's a huge change. And in general, uh, move it three is like we, it's, it's when we stop syncing move it one to move it two. So right now we're actually using Git uh, able to sync the code changes back forth them forward port. And mm. we're going to draw a line in the sand and say, we're now going to make a lot of huge breaking changes that syncing's over. And, and that's to me kind of what move it three represents. Gotcha. Any, it's, that's, it's an exciting reveal. Um, any, <laughs> <laughs> Any idea when Move It Three will be a thing? When you'll actually do that? Will it be like when this um, when this URDF or the the way of switching um, the robot to use a different gripper? Um, will that kind of be the catalyst to switch? Yeah, to three, I, or I honestly don't know the date. I'm not sure if the 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 main Move It team at Picnic knows the date yet, um, mm -hmm. but. I, it, it's just going to be one day that we're like, okay, we're making huge breaking changes. 
we're now drawing a line here. Boom, move it three. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Do you think it'll be in the next year? I hope so. <laughs> I really, yeah, uh, I definitely, I, I think so. Awesome. That'll I, be exciting. I, I'm hesitant to make commitments because um, this is still open source software and uh -huh. funding major feature changes is always difficult. We don't have anyone funding this right now. So mm -hmm. Picnic uses a small, like a portion of our profit and like our extra revenue to go towards these things. But um, if, you know, let's say uh, changing indefectors live is something that you really want and you're a company with funding, uh, you know, you can just hire us. We will do it way faster and on yep. your timeline. So that's my, my plug there <laughs> about like, we're here to do open source changes uh, for hire. Mm -hmm. Now, so uh, wrapping up, how does someone get involved with Move It if they want to? Um, like, how do they become a contributor? Uh, how should they get started? You use the word involved. I like that. So the big call to action button on the Move It website uh, says get involved. So you click that big blue button uh, at the top right. And we recently revamped these pages to be really pretty and uh, hopefully easy to follow to like guide beginners into the project. Um, it used to be just a bunch of plain text on a, on a web page. And so that's moveit.ross.org. Click the get involved button. And I'm looking at it right now. The first two things it says is, you know, get in touch, like stay in touch by following us on discourse and discord, which is unfortunately a similar name. Very similar name. Yeah. Yeah. That messed me up too. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we decided not to use Slack. We thought Discord was a better open source message. I like board. Discord much more than Slack. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree with that decision. Yeah. Okay. We, we use Slack at our company, but I think Discord's great for open source. And then on the other side, it says, you know, start contributing today. You can click on that and it'll tell you how to like get involved with fixing issues, improving documentation and contributing code. Awesome. Um, and how can... How can people, like any social media or anything that you want to? And so if anyone wants to follow up and learn more, how can they? Yeah, uh, we, we post every week on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter under Picnic Robotics handle. Um, so a lot of good content about the latest things in Move It and a lot of like white papers, kind of the latest research on how we're thinking about doing hybrid planning or grasping or, or what have you. So we, we have a lot of our PhDs published on a frequent basis there. So. I encourage you to follow us on either of those platforms. That's Picnic Robotics. And I, I have a Twitter account. I'm Waffle, just plain old Waffle. <laughs> I don't post often, though, but I always mean to. I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, awesome. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. And bye, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Audrey. That's all we have for you today. If you liked this, feel free to subscribe. Head over to the Ross Discourse if you want to comment on the episode. Thank you to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics, and I'll see you in two weeks. Bye, everyone.